And I'm going to introduce our presenter today, Sam Harlow, our awesome online learning librarian, who will be talking to us about creating engaging virtual meetings. I will be looking at the chat. Sam will be, to some extent, able to see the chat one way or another. If you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat, um, whether it's content related or something um, that I could answer tech wise. Um, and that is uh, where I will stop and let Sam take over. Great, thanks. So yeah, like Jenny said, today we're talking about creating engaging virtual meetings. You all know me. This is Sam. Um, so uh, one thing I sent these to Jenny to kind of give me uh, for her to give me feedback. And one thing she pointed out was like, am I really talking about meetings versus teaching? And um, I'm talking about both. Um, all the techniques and strategies mentioned in this presentation could be used in a virtual teaching session, whether you're at a conference uh, or with students, uh, patrons, uh, your employees, or in a meeting with your colleagues, um, a working group, uh, anything and uh, that you could do synchronously through Zoom, uh, through WebEx, this could work. So today I'm really focusing on Zoom because, um, I mean, I know I'm being recorded, but I don't think this is super controversial to say. Uh, ITS will uh, be looking at whether or not they renew their WebEx contract um, after the fall, so in December 2020. And it's looking like with um, people's feedback on Zoom and that they really like Zoom, it's going to be Zoom. Um, and we're not going to have both WebEx and Zoom at a certain point. So don't panic. We still have WebEx um, for a while, but to get used to Zoom will be important. So this presentation really talks about, um, again, just all these strategies to engage people, to do group work, collaborative writing, all these active learning strategies. But um, when I talk about learning objectives or student learning objectives, I'm also talking about meeting objectives. Uh, but if you want to learn more about, you know, student learning objectives, kind of the teaching pedagogy side of things, rubrics, um, I do have this presentation that I gave to ROI and that I've sent to a couple of different departments on sink or swim, getting started with virtual instruction at UNCG. Um, so in this presentation, I talk about that as well as asynchronous stuff. Um, so you will get a link to this presentation at the end of this um, and uh, you'll, you can uh, look through that as well. Yes. So, um, Okay, so we're really talking about active learning, right? So I know a lot of us have this training, but Bonwell and Eisen describe active learning strategies as instructional activities involving students and doing things and thinking about what they are doing. So really just getting people in our meetings or our students in our meeting to, to engage with the content. That is active learning. So um, DFINC has come and talked to you a couple of times and they build upon Bonwell and ASIN's definition by describing a holistic view of active learning that includes all of the following components, information and ideas, experience, and reflective dialogue. This framework can be a helpful tool to consider how your students encounter new information and ideas, engage with information and ideas, and reflect on their learning. So um, I'm going to talk about these strategies in terms of this framework for this presentation. I'm going to talk about encounter, engage, and reflect, and how we can think about how we can get our participants to actively engage in all of these things. So here's some examples, right? So I've had a couple of meetings in the last couple of weeks with various departments around UNCG libraries, as well as UNCG as a whole, where I have had a lot of faculty and librarians say to me, well, I do think pair share, I do peer review, I do collaborative writing, I do one minute paper, um, reflective work, student led sessions and more. So really today we're gonna talk about how to model that. So again, you know, there's kind of, People don't really like it when you say like, well, just completely duplicate what you were doing in person because that's not possible. The big thing about a lot of things is that we're used to doing these kind of activities in a shared space, whereas anything online synchronous, though we are all here at the same time virtually, we are not in the same room. Um, so we're going to talk about tools that can help you think about doing this stuff with your participants um, at a distance, you know, right, where they can't necessarily where you could think about how can you get them to talk to each other or how can you get them to work on a document together all synchronously. So again, today we're really going to focus on synchronous sessions. 
So the first thing we're going to talk about, number one, before we kind of go into the like nitty gritty of examples, ideas, and tools, is that you really need to get prepared by knowing your technology. So, you know, the ITS at this point has offered a lot of stuff on Zoom, and I would recommend continue to look at that. If you haven't been to any sessions, even if you've been in a lot of Zoom rooms, still looking through the training and understanding your options as the host are going to be really important. So um, you, we have access to Zoom meeting, which does have a 300 person limit. Um, I do think we're kind of starting to dip our feet in the water about Zoom webinar. I know for this ADAPT conference that was like an instructional technology conference for professors trying to convert stuff online for the semester, uh, for next semester, is was they did use Zoom webinar. So I guess we're like trying it out and seeing. But for now, really just assume that we have Zoom meeting, which the big difference is that it's a 300 person limit. But you can go access your settings through uncg.zoom.us. So be sure to check that out if you have it, even if you've um, only been an attendee in sessions. If you're ever planning on hosting a session, this is a good place to explore. So if you go there and you log in, uh, the first thing you're going to see is a thing on the left where you can look at your settings. This is where you can set up that thing you can see in the chat of different engagement levels where people can give you a thumbs up. Um, let you know to slow down, speed up, that kind of thing. That has to be turned on in your settings. Um, another thing, as Jenny was saying at the beginning, you can turn on that bell when people enter the room. By default, that is turned off, but if you want to turn that on, you can. So all those kinds of options, including setting up breakout rooms ahead of time. Um, so um, keep that in mind. So um, and we're going to talk about breakout rooms and Zoom in this training. Um, and again, they're still doing trainings on Zoom. This link right here goes out to ITS's webpage, UNCG ITS, where you could look for their workshops. Um, so again, speaking of the workshops, here is a lot of links that I'm not going to go out into all of them, but here's a lot of different resources we have on not only like Zoom and virtual meetings and tech, but also um, instructional technology, right? Thinking about these different tools, what you can and can't use at UNCG, what we support, um, and what workshops are being offered. So um, here are the tech training, the instructional tech trainings I've offered over the last three years, um, which covers a lot of the things we're gonna talk about today, such as the nitty gritty of Zoom, the um, uh, links to breakout rooms, sorry, there's a bug, and um, links to polling tools, things like that. Um, ITS knowledge base is um, the ITS uh, place where all of the documentation gets stored. Uh, so you can go there and search Zoom and it's going to show you how to log in, it's going to show you a link to workshops and the things that ITS is offering. We um, have been offering two webinar series at UNCG for years that we typically promote to people teaching um, at UNCG, but they're open to librarians and all of the recordings are available there. So we do one on research and application that I know many of you have um, done stuff for, but we also do one hosted typically by ITCs, Instructional Technology Consultants on online learning and innovation. So we've had stuff, uh, again, that I'm gonna talk about today on there, such as hyperdocs and um, making collaborative writing documents. We've had sessions on creating more engaging sessions, uh, best practices of virtual meetings, uh, using these different kinds of tools. So check that out if you haven't. They're all 30 minutes, so pretty short and recorded. And I think Michael's here, um, him and Marcus are doing a great job uh, helping us with closed captioning those as well. So they should all be uh, good to go with that. So um, we also have this instructional technology toolkit, which really links out to just overall, again, documentation about these tools. Uh, the Digital Media Commons and the Digital Act Studio are here to help. I think some of y'all are here today. Uh, they can help you with, again, creating engaging online content, uh, instructional technology tools, all that kind of stuff. And then we have the learning technology training and workshop page. If you haven't been there, it's a, in the last couple of months, it's a new platform, I think about six months ago, where you can sign up for virtual, they're all virtual now, virtual workshops on a variety of these tools. And lastly, we have this page on accessibility at UNCG. So thinking about preparation is key. So knowing your tool, looking at your settings, thinking about how you want people to come into your Zoom room, what settings you want to use in Zoom. But also, um, it, it also means like preparing your session. Like, so for today, when I did this session, I made this slide deck. Um, and it doesn't always mean memorizing a script. I did not write a script for this. Um, it depends on how much you know, how what your style is. Again, it's similar to that face-to-face -face interaction. How do you work best? 
Do you need a piece of paper in front of you that reminds you to slow down to look at the chat? Like sometimes I have to do that as again, you all know from seeing me present, I speak quickly. So again, kind of knowing your presentation style and adapting that to the online environment. Um, a lot of times with synchronous meetings, something to keep in mind is that it will take more time to do activities than they um, don't. So thinking about your timing as well. So students prefer instructors to be themselves, but not sound super rehearsed, right? They like you to be able to flex. They like you to be able to like engage with them in the chat. If they bring up a story, kind of bring that into your teaching and lecture, um, check in with them periodically, um, acknowledge that what's happening in the chat again. Don't be, um, and we're gonna talk about this, but I've kind of mentioned this throughout. Don't be afraid to have activities that you would utilize in your face-to-face -face class. So if you do a think pair share anything like that, um, to keep in mind that you could also use it here. So make sure your activities connect to your student learning objectives um, or again, your meeting objectives, right? So if you have an agenda um, for a meeting, you have objectives, that's your objectives. Uh, make sure you're connecting back to that um, and touching base with your agenda periodically. So think about if you need requirements in your session, right? So like tech requirements, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit, but like, you know, participants will come in on a phone and that really does affect collaboration. Uh, so keeping that in mind and again, being flexible with the activities you plan are gonna be really important. So let students use the chat to interact with each other. So even if you're not using chat, um, having the students like answer a couple of fun questions at the beginning is great. They typically like that as an icebreaker. So something I do with my online classes is I'll say, you know, tell me about what you're watching on um, the TV. Like, so right now I'm watching Killing Eve on Hulu. What are y'all watching? And then, you know, or if you're like, if you don't watch TV, what book are you reading right now? Um, things like that. And that can kind of get it started as you're getting the stuff up, kind of going through the lecture activity. So knowing your technology, um, you know, we talked about that, but also it's limitations, right? So thinking about the participant limit, um, thinking about what it can and can't do in terms of breakout rooms, what's recorded is gonna be important. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked about prepping, getting prepared, we're gonna talk about um, screen sharing and dimming. So the, the encounter part of active learning. Um, so I'm gonna check the chat. If anyone has any questions, let me know. Um, if y'all don't mind, I'm actually gonna mute myself for just one second because my two-year-old is screaming in the background. So let me get my five-year-old involved. I'll be back in one second. Sorry. <laughs> okay, the, the five-year-old's gonna help the two-year-old. It'll be great. Okay, so thinking about your instruction, right? So like, um, and y'all can tell me in the chat, um, I know not everyone here is an instruction librarian, does instruction for their job, but a lot of us, if we are instructional librarians, have had to maybe host a meeting, um, host a uh, session, a workshop, or a conference presentation. Uh, again, I'm kind of talking about instruction in more of a lecturing, leading point of view. Um, so flipping instruction, which is the idea that you can give your participants something to do or read ahead of time, works really well in an online environment. So is there some kind of reading or video that you can send to your participants ahead of time so that you can spend less time lecturing, right? Like what I'm kind of doing to y'all now. And then um, more time like having a conversation, using the chat, um, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, someone just said put Rico in charge. Yeah, that's my dog. He's uh, right next to me. He, he don't care that the two-year-old is crying. So, um, when you're thinking about beyond flipped learning as well, there another thing to keep in mind with your lecturing style, with how you present online, is connecting these active learning strategy, right? Engaging your participants with um, something called Universal Design for Learning, uh, UDL. So thinking about accessibility is beyond just like making sure a screen reader works on it. It also is thinking about accessibility by creating multiple forms of representation, engagement, action and expression. Uh, so um, when you're lecturing, when you are thinking about that, ideally you're thinking about cr creating, um, you know, not one kind of style, right? Like we don't really know how students learn. 
That's the thing about accessibility. People learn in a lot of different ways, have a lot of different learning styles, preferences. Um, so thinking about different ways you could kind of hit upon, again, representation, engagement, action expression will be key. So if you want to learn more about this, this is not a whole you know, uh, ULVL session about this. There's a link here to a presentation Amy and I did a couple years ago for NCLA on online learning and connecting um, UDL. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is screen share. So this is the most used feature of Zoom, WebEx, any kind of virtual meetings for a good reason, right? It's important to demo things for your audience. It's important to, for them to see your screen, to see some kind of visual, um, right? I remember when I first started at the School of Education as an instructional technology consultant, and we would get complaints because there were professors who were teaching online, but they weren't using any visuals, right? It was just audio. And students were um, getting frustrated because they were saying they had a hard time engaging with the content. So again, use it. Uh, most people do, and again, there is a reason behind that. So here's some kind of tips and tricks to think about when you think about screen sharing and lecture. Um, and <laughs> I'm not perfect. <laughs> I probably, I need to take my own advice occasionally. So be sure to pause and breathe. Take breaks after slides or, you know, periodically throughout the presentation to check in with your participants. So you're going to use the chat, right, uh, to drop links and communicate with, and if there's a co-presenter, that's a good thing where y'all can kind of switch off, right? Someone can be lecturing, someone can be monitoring the chat periodically. Again, I said this before, but engage the chat, right? If someone brings up that um, they're really connecting to UDL or that they've used UDL, like share that. Let them, give them a chance to share it. Um, take a break. So again, with your timing, thinking about allowing extra time for this kind of flexibility will be great. Um, and being flexible overall, I believe is important really in any meeting, in any instruction, but it's particularly important for online where, again, the, you're, there's a lot of things that are out of your control. So in a classroom, a lot of times you can say like, everyone put your phone away so that I know you're not playing on your phone. You can do that. Um, I don't do that, but some people do. In a, on an online environment, you can't do that. There's no way you can make them uh, not be playing on their phone. I mean, again, I've done it in a meeting, like we've all done it in a meeting, it's fine. Um, but then again, having these kind of check-ins in the chat, giving them these activities that we're about to talk about are a good way to make sure that they're engaging at least a little bit beyond just watching your lecture. So going beyond your slide helps, right? So like I always recommend, like a lot of people will share the whole PowerPoint. I actually recommend um, sharing your screen and being willing to flex, right? So in that you can now X out of it and be like, oh, you know, someone just brought up this database. Let me quickly bring it up, right? Like I was able to quickly X out of that presentation, go into a browser and showcase something um, in that way. So again, you don't have to only stick to your slides um, and keep that in mind. But with the, but also again, know your technology, know your audience. Maybe for a, um, you know, a conference presentation, they don't want you doing that. Maybe they would rather have screenshots of the database. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Okay, so now that we've talked about again, the lecturing part, the engaged part, again, I'm going to pause and I'm checking the chat. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, sorry that my kids are running around. They'll survive. Um, so now we're going to talk about actual things to do to engage. Now that I've done the opposite of what we talked about and lectured y'all for a good, you know, 15 minutes. Um, so let's do it. So the things to think about before you think about group work, think, pair, share, again, all these different kinds of like synchronous group things we can do online. There's some considerations that you need to think about that maybe you wouldn't think about as much for a face-to-face. -face. So something for a face-to-face -face meeting, you do think about your audience, right? You think about like, are they coming in with a laptop? Do they have a laptop? Um, is it necessary for them to have a laptop? Am I in a computer lab? Um, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, with ROI, a lot of times the way we do our instruction is in the computer labs in Jackson Library, because then we know they're going to have access to this computer that gives them access to the internet. And we know it has these tools that are, you know, pre-downloaded by our amazing Eric uh, crew. So um, with online, you don't, you can't control that. You know that they're somehow entering right, in terms of uh, being on a phone or being on a computer, but you do not know whether they are on a phone or a computer, um, you know, unless you tell them that ahead of time. 
right? So a lot of this group work, it really works best on a computer um, or a Chromebook. We're going to talk a lot about Google apps, you know, which will work on a Chromebook. Um, but something like a breakout room does not work on mobile. So if you're planning an activity like this for a class, you'll have to really give them a lot of heads up about that. And also be prepared that not everyone is going to be able to participate um, and have a backup plan in place. So if timing is an issue, then you need to keep that in mind. Um, I like that, uh, you know, excellent rad information technology. Um, so, sorry, my five-year-old's here um, and trying to tell me something. But Rose, you need to go get me. I'm presenting. I love this. Okay, y'all you, keep doing that. No, I gave you all your toy. Okay. Okay. I gotta keep presenting, okay? <laughs> I love you very much. Um, is time an issue? So again, like I said, if you um, if you have a you know a presentation you need to give, whether it's for a conference, you know, you need to think about what are the important points that I have to make in terms of lecture, demo, and then what are the activities? And then if you think an activity is gonna take, let's say three minutes, I would give yourself seven just to be sure that you can flex people and their technology um so keep that yes you can have your own. sorry so are you connecting back to the objectives yes you can get a minute or go are you connecting back to your student learning objectives or your meeting objectives um so again always going back to what are you trying to achieve Sometimes people think that like you have to have group work to keep people interested. That's not always the case. Remember, especially in this COVID-19 reality we're in, where you just heard it happening with me, a lot of times people are juggling, right? Their children, their uh, caregiving responsibilities, maybe their dog is an issue, maybe their, their internet is bogged down based on where they live, maybe they had to come in a mobile because they're, you know, waiting somewhere to pick someone up. We just don't know anyone's situation uh, in this kind of virtual environment. So again, just again, it all goes back to that common theme. I should have named this presentation. Being flexible, uh, having backup plans, and that kind of thing. So, um, Okay, so we're going to try out breakout rooms with this audience, but I also have a link here for y'all to watch um, on a three minute video by Zoom um, where um, they, you know, have used their fancy equipment where you see a video view, like a bird's eye view of how they do breakout rooms. So because of the nature of Zoom, I can't like screen, I can't, uh, you know, present to you how I'm showing you the breakout rooms, but pretty much it's a button at the bottom of your screen. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'll turn my, um, turn my video back on for a second. I muted myself. Um, so the way it works is like, here we are as a group, right? You can pre-assign breakout rooms. You have to do that in your Zoom settings, which I talked about at uncg.zoom.us after you um, schedule the session. So you schedule the session and then click edit, and then you'll see an option to add in breakout rooms. You can also upload a CSV file of participant names that will shoot them into rooms that you can assign. But the way it works is that if you're the host at the bottom of your screen, you um, go up here to, uh, there's a breakout room option which I'm actually not seeing, so, but I'm the host. So anyway, usually if you're the host, there is a breakout room option. And again, you, be sure you check your settings ahead of time. Um, so again, okay, someone just made me the host. So um, you'll see then, if you don't see it at the bottom of your screen, you can go into breakout rooms, right? And it is um, an option under more. So from there, you click on a button and then you're gonna get um, how many participants in the room. So in this session, we have 13, and then I can decide how many rooms. So I'm gonna set up two rooms, and then you have an automatic or manual option. If you select manual, it's gonna shoot you where you'll have to pick who's in each room. But I'm gonna do automatic, where it's gonna, because of, there's 13 of us, it's gonna create uh, two rooms of about six to seven participants per room, and it tells me all of that. And then I'm gonna click create room, it tells me the room. So right now I'm seeing that in breakout room, it's gonna be Ann Brown, Cheryl, Jenny, Pat Kelly, Sean, Terry Bransma, and then breakout room two is gonna be Anna, 
Lois, Marilyn, Mark, Michael, and Sarah. So I'm going to go, and y'all are going to be get a message. And y'all can go to your rooms. I see people joining. Great. Okay, I see people coming back in. Hopefully that was fun. Y'all saw how it looked in terms of participants, right? What's, what you had, what you don't have. If you wanna understand more what your participants are able to do and not do, again, be sure you check out your settings in uncg.zoom.us. Um, so the way it's working right now is that there are a couple of people still hanging out in the breakout rooms. Um, so, uh, you know, they'll have to come back. Um, breakout room two seems to still be holding on. Um, maybe they're planning something. But um, right now I'm seeing a message on my screen that says all breakout rooms will close regardless in 10 seconds. So again, they're coming back now. Wow, group two, y'all must have really had fun. So, um, and now see they're done. So after the breakout rooms are done, the way it works is that as the host, you get a message that it keeps the room. So I could go back to lecturing right now and then minimize this and keep it up. And then in five minutes, I could reopen the exact same rooms. I also can drag and drop or no, it actually says moved to if I hover above someone's name. So like if I thought like Anna was being inappropriate in breakout room two, I could move her or exchange her for another person to a different room. Um, so that's the way it worked. So Sam, we had a question in the yeah. chat and I don't know if you could see it because Brown asked it in our breakout room. Um, and so I don't know if those chats are available to everyone or not. So that's my question actually. Let me look. So I can join rooms as host. So um, I can't see the chats as they're happening. I have to join the room. Okay. So actually, that was what his question was. He asked, are you in one of the rooms? So the host. Yeah, no, I could have joined, but I wanted okay. you all to just like see it on your own. Um, I could have hopped into one and then the other. As the person who starts the um, breakout room, you're kind of like the, the god of the breakout rooms. You decide when they went, they end, you can hop back and forth between them. Uh, you have to, I think, join to chat them. But did you all see my broadcast messages, right? Yes, we did. So that was me clicking a button in the um, field that said broadcast message to all. And then it went to both groups simultaneously. But I don't see your responses to it unless I join a room. That was my first time doing that in Zoom. So hopefully that was fun. You can set up move all participants into breakout rooms automatically. You can allow participants to return to the main session at any time. That's how that one was set up. Uh, you can have breakout rooms close automatically after X amount of minutes. So if you wanted to set kind of a timer where it happens automatically, that works. Um, you can count down after closing breakout room. 
um, as well. So the countdown we had set up automatically by default was 60 seconds, but you can make it shorter or longer. Okay, so any other questions about breakout rooms before I go back to um, screen sharing? Hopefully that was uh, fun. If, I, I don't know if y'all have ever done that before. I've heard at UNCG people are starting to use it, but um, there it is. We did it. Okay, so there are other things beyond breakout rooms. Again, the issue, breakout rooms are fun, but the issue with breakout rooms is if you have, um, if you're like teaching, for example, to an LIS class or another class, um, maybe it's not um, a class that they're requiring synchronous activities. And if that's the case, they might not have a laptop. Maybe their laptop's broken. Maybe a lot of people thought, well, this is just going to be a lecture and I'm just going to sit and watch on my phone again while I'm like making dinner. Um, so you really have to prepare your um, participants. And again, for me, even when I've done them with like an LIS class, which those are required to be synchronous courses, so I think like the first time I ever did it, I just was like, well, yeah, like they're going to be coming in on laptops from their house because like this is a three hour lecture. Why would they, you know, be in their car? Incorrect. They, a lot of them were in their car, in their, uh, you know, at another person's house, you know, watching their kids at the same time. So I've learned from that, that, you know, if you're going to do something like that, you give them a big heads up, you give them time and you also give them alternatives. So alternatives that we're going to talk about next are um, Google apps. So, um, let me, my chat's not showing up, so let me put it up. It's hiding. Um, so yeah, Brown said, my professor used breakout rooms in the waiting room to have one-on-one -on -one discussions during office hours. Interesting. I like it. Great strategy. Um, yeah, and you could do pairings like, you know, like that would be another way that you could do think, pair, share. Um, right, if you wanted to have pairs of people communicating with each other, you would just have to create, you know, a lot of breakout rooms of two. So um, Google Apps also works really well for collaborative activities. So really, um, I'm going to talk about Google Docs, Google Sheets, and Google Form. And I'm also going to talk about Google Slides. But y'all probably know by now that all Google Apps have the ability that when you share a link to a form, right, you can either create it as a view link, that's the default, Right, and it defaults to when you set up a view link that you do it first at UNCG, but you can also turn it on that anyone can view, but you can also switch it on the right to anyone can view to anyone can edit. So if you create these editable links to Google Docs, Google Sheets, um, then you've created a collaborative document that many people can work on at the same time synchronously um, in a session. And then you as the lecturer can pull them up, watch it happen and monitor it. Again, going back to think about your audience, um, the only control you have over a Google Doc, you can kick someone out of a Zoom room, right? You can kick someone out of a breakout room. You can join breakout rooms. A Google Doc, you know, once they have that editable link, uh, and you probably, you know, the anonymous animals come up, if they start misbehaving or doing something on that, you, it's hard to kick them off. All you can really do is like shut it down, make it uneditable. Um, so keep that in mind if you're working with um, certain audiences that that might be a problem. So um, Google Docs and Google Sheets were pretty much the same, but like, you know, a doc would be that you wanted to kind of be in that document format, whereas Sheets puts it in the Excel format, right, with columns and rows. Um, both of those are that everyone can see the work being done. So if you want people to kind of answer you on the back end and then you can share their results, a Google form is more private, right, where you can't, it can be anonymous, you can't see, um, you know, people working in real time, you can like set a timer up. So again, it's more like a poll on that. So I use all three of these typically in a lecture to a class um, to do activities. So I'm going to show you some examples of how that could work. So here's a class I teach for LIS um, where I have them do a rubric activity where I use a combo of Google Docs and Google Forms. So I'm going to go out to the Google Doc. So I, what I do is I drop the link to this Google Doc in the chat, right? And then I have, I kind of guide them through what the activity is going to be. So this activity is going to be that um, we're going to review the AASL standards for the 20th century learner, which is the um, American Association of School Librarians. 
So we go through the standards and frameworks. We think through what it's for, why it exists, and then really what we're looking at here are these on page four, which I mark in my Google Doc, of their domains and competencies and their shared foundations and key commitments. Then we um, talk about, we at this point in the lecture, we've already talked about what a rubric is, right? And then what I'm asking them to do is look at this, the share learners, adapt, communicate, and exchange learning project with others in a cycle that includes interacting with content presented by others, blah, 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 blah. And then I show them an example of a rubric that I have made about another, about different competencies, right? Think and create. And then I have a comment, right, that these are the values and these are the criteria and like a little sample rubric. So then once they've kind of thought through it, they get about five minutes to come up with their own that they put into a Google form. So the question, I have questions and then comments. So then as they're working on this, I could have a timer up, like y'all probably seen those timers you can get from like YouTube or Google. And then when they're done, I have their responses right here. And I can go through it with them, right? I can be like, okay, great, I love your values. Okay, there's still some confusion about values. So let's talk through this a little bit more, um, that kind of thing. I see, you know, if they really think this is a useful activity for their maker spaces, for the future of maker spaces, and then, um, you know, what do you like? What do you not like? What are some comments? And then some of them like recommend things, so on. So let me know if there's any questions about that. So here's an example of an editable link um, for the same class where we talk about makerspace websites and we run a group activity um, on, through a Google spreadsheet. So they um, typically have about 30 minutes to do this with 30 students. Um, so here's an example from a class um, that I taught in the summer of 2017, where I have them, um, you know, again, I have the instructions at the top. Step one, what are you doing? So um, they are actually put into breakout rooms for this. They have five minutes to go over the websites individually. They fill answer comments on the spreadsheet. Um, they pick an answer and then they pick a speak person to speak for their group. So what they're doing is they're, each group is going out into these different websites. And then they put a kind of summary of what they think of the website. So again, they're doing this themselves. They get an editable link. So if y'all don't know how to make an editable link, just quickly, you click on share. And then right here, this is a view link, right? But you can click change from viewer to editor. And if this is set to UNCG, be sure you warn your participants that they need to be logged into their UNCG account to access it. You just change it to editor and then anyone who has this can go in and edit the spreadsheet. Again, if there's any questions or concern, let me know. So there's something called Google Hyperdocs that people have spent, you know, like full hours have dedicated a lot of time talking about. But basically it's the same idea of creating group and collaborative activities using Google Docs and Google Slides. So this was invent invented by K-12 teachers um, and they have full books about it. Um, here are the teachers who invented it. Um, so you can buy a book. Uh, you can also look through their website. They have a lot of different resources about what it is, how to use them. And they also have tons of templates, right? So ways to package them. So let's say you're like, okay, I want a Google Doc, HyperDoc. You can click on that and see how I'm now, I'm on a Google Doc and I can go to file, make a copy, and it's gonna put this in my Google Doc where I can then create an editable link to this and fill out my information if I wanted to create a similar activity about going places with Google Maps, or again, my own learning objectives for this kind of thing. Um, so um, this is also a full website, um, again, of templates. So if you wanted to create a Google slide, um, I've been a part of conference presentations that did that. You can just click, like you're like, this looks great. I'm gonna do a, this framework for 21st century learners. You can click here, and then it automatically creates the copy for you that you can name and start editing. Um, and so this then, again, similar to the Google Doc, the Google Spreadsheet, the, the Google Sheets, right? You can then create an editable link where people can fill out their own Google slide based on the instructions you give them. How'd you get out of the crib, May? I helped her. Okay, so much later. So, ah! shh, 
Y'all, I'm presenting. I have them. You can have a mint. I already gave them. Go get some snacks. Fine, give her gum. But y'all stay in the kitchen. I better not find gum somewhere. Sorry. I love my children. Um, okay, and so then you could go into here again, create a, you know, again, here's some stuff to think about. Sometimes people create slides where they have groups already predetermined. So you could say, you know, in your own here, file here, group one, right? Names that start with, y'all go downstairs. Right? So on and so on. Depending on your group, maybe you would want to do the next one. And so on, right? And then when it's sent out, I could send y'all an editable link. I could have instructions in here of what I wanted you to do. And then you would be filling out, right? Text box, images, you could insert a bitmoji, a picture of yourself. Um, again, whatever the activity had. Um, I just was in a webinar session where they're doing a webinar about, uh, you know, information literacy instruction and uh, deficit, deficit and equity. And they're going to be doing a lot of group activities using Google Docs. The Google Docs are going to be set up like this, where they have a tiny URL for each group, um, even though there's going to be like 300 people in the room. And then uh, people are going to go out and like fill out the Google Docs. So again, if you have worksheets, if you have these think pair shares already set up, you can split them up based on how many people are going to be in there. These kind of activities do work on a mobile device or a Chromebook. Um, the mobile device, they might have to download an app uh, to, you know, edit the slides, edit the doc. Um, and so again, you could give them a heads up at the beginning of the session or ahead of time, depending on that. So here's a webinar that Rachel did um, in the fall or maybe last year, what is time, uh, where she goes through it and gives you more resources and shows examples too. Okay, so some people are like, man, I don't even want Google. I'm moving forward. Um, another one that I hear a lot about is Padlet. So Padlet is not technically a UNCG supported tool. So here's my pitch of like, if you use Padlet, you're on your own. Do not put in a ticket to ERIT or to um, UNCG ITS about Padlet. Uh, but you know, if you want to try it out and play with it, it is a tool you can use that is just a different visual outlook and people can edit it at the same time. So similar to anything that we've talked about today, right? Zoom, breakout rooms, Google apps, you need to understand the settings. So don't just go to Padlet and share a link. You need to make sure it's an editable link. If that's how you're doing it, you need to make sure you test it ahead of time. Um, you also need to understand the limitations of a free tool that UNCG does not have an account to. Last I checked, and I think they might have changed it for COVID-19. Um, and again, some tools are doing that, but again, might revert back in the fall, who knows, um, is that you can only have five Padlets at a time. You can make a copy of a Padlet, um, so don't delete, so you can copy a Padlet over and then delete one as you create new ones. But here's an example. So I actually, Kathleen, um, I don't think she's here, but she sent this to me um, as an example of something that SCUA might want to do, that Tammy Grewer from UNCG LIS did, um, help them do when they did a workshop with uh, K through 12 teachers, uh, just to make sure I'm like, referencing all the right people. So Tammy Grewer created this um, for a workshop they were doing with teachers about primary sources. So you can see here they had the session that, you know, it's a column based thing. Um, there's other layouts too, but columns seem to be pretty popular for this kind of activity. So they had the column resources embedded on the left. They had instructions of the activity they wanted to do. So again, you need to make sure you type out the instructions that you really think through how it's going to work. And then they had the groups pre-determined um, by the school with the assigned reading. And then people could comment on the reading based on the instructions on this column um, under instructions. So sorry, I don't have a link uh, to this, but Kathleen sent me the screenshot. Uh, and so this is something that you could recreate kind of once you got to know Padlet. So here's another example of a teacher who set up one with her students on themes in Persopolis. Uh, I think I'm saying Persopolis, um, where the students put their names, groups with their names, and then put comments on it. Uh, so again, you could drop a link to this in the chat. The big thing with Padlet is you need to make sure that it's an editable one. So right now they've turned off the editing, right? If, you, if it is set up to be editable, you'll see a little plus button right here, and then you can add a thing. 
One, to keep in, one thing to keep in mind about Padlet for this kind of format of synchronous sessions with the boxes is that as people are adding things in in real time, the boxes shift and it can be very disorienting. So be careful. Um, that might be what was just commented in the chat. Um, so keep that in mind. Yes, so Jenny said, I love Padlet. So yeah, my big thing with Padlet is just, again, if you're using it synchronously, I do recommend um, this type of layout, right, of the columns, because then it keeps it organized. Whereas when you have the kind of boxes layout that I showed you there, um, they shift. So here's an example um, really quickly of um, one I sent in a flipped way to my Ken uh, EDD one, where I have them tell me their research interest ahead of time. And uh, see, I put one in there so that I could know myself here, right? And then um, they then fill out things with their research interest and I can then know, right, for their whole time here, uh, what their research is. And so this is, you know, nice for me to have. Um, it also saves me time in these, like, I only get them for about an hour in these orientations where I don't, like, where everyone goes around and introduce themselves, where I can, like, look at this ahead of time and keep that in mind. So again, notice here, there isn't, because I am the editor of this, I can click on this plus button and add things. Um, and then when you go to share, this is where you need to make sure you're really, um, you know, clear, right? Are you making this private or public? Is it secret? Um, you know, are you, you know, this wouldn't work, right, for everyone if I just sent them this link right now. Whereas right now, or maybe they can, I don't know. My point is that just be careful and test it on a different browser where you're not logged into Padlet. Um, so Padlet's heavily used in K-12, like a lot of this stuff. So a good thing to get inspiration is that you can Google um, Padlet's used for um, virtual sessions, Padlet's used for education, and you'll see a lot of stuff. Um, Padlet's do expire. So when you're looking at it, there might be a lot of broken links. So one strategy would be to look through Google images. So you can kind of see a visual of what people have used. And then again, get your own inspiration and make it on your own. Yeah, Jenny said, don't use it with middle school students. Because again, like a lot of these tools I talked about, if it gets out of control, like if they start writing things like boobs in it, it's hard to like kind of, uh, you know, keep it under control. So, you know, like usual, I feel like I'm running out of time, um, but uh, polling is really nice to do to engage people beyond the chat. Um, and so you can do things with live polling. So um, Mentimeter has no um, person limit, but you can only create two questions at the time and it does expire. So like when you make it, it's default to expire after two days. You can change it to seven days, but again, make sure you test it the morning of your presentation. Um, so we're gonna quickly do one if you want. Uh, if you go to www.menti.com on your own device and then type in the code, two six zero five eight seven you should see this and then i'm going to show you how it looks on the background real fast and then we'll kind of wrap this up i promise So I put that in the chat. So Mentimeter is actually the website where you log in as the presenter. So I'm logged in. So I can go to my And then y'all, I can, you'll see the thing in real time. So here is the presentation. Right? And you can see, right, how they come in in real time. So this can be nicer if you're looking for these kind of bubble approaches than Padlet because it doesn't shift and disorient people in this way. It's anonymous. It's a good way to kind of gauge people's knowledge, um, that kind of thing. So I think I know you said D&D &D gaming sessions. Yes. I hope this helps. Um, okay. So y'all saw it. <laughs> Hi, Brown. Um, so just to show you too, um, you know, again, to be sensitive of time, um, this is the present mode. Um, and then when you're done, you can um, exit. And just to show you, um, you can make two, only two in one presentation. So that is one of the limits. 
create multiple ones that you kind of do throughout. They'll just have to use different codes. But here are your options. Um, if I make a new one, right, um, you can do multiple choice where they give you a little demo, word cloud, open-ended, which is what you just saw, scales. I do this a lot of times to gauge knowledge, right? Like how experienced do you feel you are like this on a scale of one to five, one being low, five being high or whatever. Ranking, similar, image choice, and then a Q and A, which is more like, a, um, you know, what is your opinion? And they give you a kind of description at the bottom of every single one. Um, so a Minimeter is free to use. Again, it's not a UNCG supported Poll, so use at your own risk, but um, again, it doesn't have audience limits, so it's good for conferences. So UNCG is currently running a pilot of um, Poll Everywhere, so if you're interested, you can email me and I can get you in touch with Learning Technologies, but that connects to Google Slides and Canvas through this pilot, so it might be a good time to test that out. So there's lots of other polling tools that's linked here. Um, some other ones are like Socrative. I talked about Google Forms. We went over Minimeter and Poll everywhere. Um, but if you want to check out more, you can do that. And they change quickly. But the big thing is always to make sure you check the settings, expiration dates, audience limits, and things like that. So UNCG has a thing called Go Links. Um, it's if you just go to go.uncg.edu, it's linked here. Um, you can create basically tiny URLs when you log in. Um, so not only do they create these kind of short links to your, um, to maybe the Google Doc that you've made, the Google Slides you've made, the spreadsheet that you've made, um, they also show you how much they're being hit. So if it's a conference presentation, this can be really nice um, because you can kind of get an idea if people are engaging with your stuff um, enough. Uh, maybe you're into Twitter or things like that. You can see if, like, you know, things have made sense or what the most things are used. Um, I think that's my uh, NC Docs profile. Look at that, Anna. You're here, I think. So um, I can see, like, people are actually using the Go link to my NC Docs pri profile and really hitting it up. So it's nice. Um, and again, it can be really nice if you're doing group work with Google Docs or with this stuff because you could say, you know, go.uncg.edu slash lib group one right, lib group two, um, that kind of thing, and keep it organized and um, easily drop, you can easily drop them in the chat uh, to get people to engage with it. So um, I don't think I have time, but y'all will have the link to this, but the last part of the like, you know, uh, practice of active learning is reflect. So polling is great for assessment. Um, here's an example of an, a quick Google form I dropped for a um, webinar I did for public health right, where I'm, see, I'm having them name a library database, provide a permalink. I usually also have them say, what's something you learned from the session? What's something you wish was covered more from this session? You can see then, um, you can also use this as like formative assessment, right, um, or a pretest, post test, right? You could have them do one at the beginning, see how they do, and then create a separate one for the end uh, and see if they learn things. So um, assessment, here's the LibGuide for assessment here at UNCG. Um, but really a lot of the stuff you do in your like face-to-face -face instruction or for a conference can be used, um, again, as long as you drop it in the chat, make sure you're sharing it properly, you test it ahead of time. Uh, if you wanna use it for formative assessment, again, most of those polling forms that I showed you, uh, Qualtrics, Google Forms has an option where you can show results as they come in. And then lastly, if you want to learn more about this, there is a link to a full PowerPoint I did for uh, project outcomes on online learning and assessment. Boom. Wow. Six minutes left. Whew. We did it, guys. Okay. Are there any questions? Concerns? I'm sorry for my children. Doing my best. I don't think I've seen any questions come up, um, but if anyone has any questions, this is a great time. Um, Sam, one thing I put in the chat was that if people were interested in a full session on interactive tools, like some of the ones you talked about today, that we could certainly make that happen. Um, so, oh, look at all this nice love in the chat. Thanks, so, everyone. Y'all are awesome. Thanks for, for the listening. recording. So, I yeah, y'all saw, know. I mean, I'm glad I got to test out breakout rooms. Cause yeah. like, a lot of times I don't want to do it with students because now with COVID-19, they're like, they're exhausted, they're like doing five things at once. Um, so mostly for my class I'm teaching right now for LIS, um, I mostly have been doing um, Google Forms and Google Docs as my engagement activities um, and because they can access it on their phones. Um, so that's been the strategy I've taken. But I think, again, writing groups, virtual writing groups have been using breakout rooms a lot. 
Um, it can be great, again, for a small group that you know they like are gonna be able to handle it. Like it was great to test with y'all today. Um, and, uh, you know, so I would recommend it. Um, again, it can be good for like, I think like SCUA has a workshop coming up, a retreat. It could be good for retreats, right? Department retreats. We might have to be doing virtually for a while. Um, so yeah, it can be a great way to do group work. I'm glad we got to play with it. I think it works better in Zoom than WebEx too, if anyone felt scarred from their WebEx experiences. I agree, it's much smoother in Zoom um, yeah. than, it, than it is in WebEx. So I like the Zoom breakout rooms better. Um, so for the recording, I just wanna share that uh, Sam got a lot of love in the chat. She was identified as awesome. Great. Her slides are beautiful. Her children are great. And yeah. Sexy. Um, and Anne appreciates that your children were involved. I think that's important. They, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure the fact that May was involved means May did not nap today, my two-year-old. So thoughts and prayers for me Yay. this afternoon. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, I will, Pat. I'll tell Rose you said hi. T's and P's, yes. Um, yeah, I'm like a I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording now because I am feeling like people don't have questions.